you reach a point in medicine where you decide, are you going to become a specialist? What that means literally is you take a textbook with about 3,000 pages and you learn every word in that textbook because you could be questioned on anything. And I remember there were about, if you come to a doctor with a temperature, there are about 100 causes. And that's called pyrexia of unknown origin. And, and the person who can remember the 100th is a really clever guy, you see. But if you only remember 99, well, you're not so clever. And what I've learned in my career is that the best thing to have to get into medicine is a photographic memory, an eidetic memory. And the two people who influenced my career the most had eidetic memories. And they were brilliant lecturers and brilliant writers, but they were clueless about creativity. They mm. couldn't create new ideas. And so what, that's what happens in medicine. The people who become the leaders have this eidetic memory and they can't create. They, why should you? If you can pick up a book and remember everything in the book, why do you have to create anything new? But I wasn't like that. I had, didn't have an eidetic memory. So I had to go and work things out. The only way I could remember things is if I could work out how it logically fitted one to the other. And so that was, I was, that's why I'm skeptical because mm. I want to know, but how do, when you say that, where's the evidence and how does it link to other information that I have? So the scientist who isn't skeptical, who isn't maverick is by definition, not a scientist. Yeah. If you're not controversial, you're not a scientist. Hi, folks. This is Dr. Rob Sivis. Um, I am the Carb Addiction Doc, and I've been working in this space for 23 years. Um, the epiphany, the aha moment happened to me in my own journey with obesity and metabolic health, and I've been working in this space for 23 years, having started out in the laboratory with my PhD, demonstrating the danger of sugar, the damage that sugar can do to the, to the body and to organs of the body. However, one of the big pushbacks in the ketogenic space is that, oh, it's just a fad diet. Oh, everybody gains their weight back. Oh, you can't sustain. All the BS. And then part of it is there is no science to support this. There is no science to support this. Well, we've known in our space that that is absolutely wrong. But for the first time, you've got, push, you've got the opportunity for pushback. And what I'm, what I'm talking about is this book. This book is called Ketogenic. The Science science of Therapeutic Carbohydrate Restriction in Human Health. This is a big textbook written by 62 authors from across the world. I have, I'm, I'm kind of humbled by the fact that I was asked to write three book chapters on this in this book. I wrote the chapter on the liver, which is the heart and, <laughs> it's the liver, it's not the heart, but it's the it's the primary place of human metabolism. It's the regulator of human metabolism. So the liver was a very, very important uh, um, topic to write. And I wrote that here, and I've subsequently recorded some videos on this. And you will see my talk um, that came out of that book chapter uh, on this channel in, in a, a few episodes' time. I also wrote the body weight chapter. And I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. It's the carbohydrate addiction concept of weight management, and it covers anorexia as well as obesity. And then the third chapter I wrote was, because I'm a pediatric surgeon as well as an adult general surgeon, and I have a passion for the human brain, I wrote uh, the chapter on autism spectrum disorder and gave an interesting perspective on this. And in fact, we're going to follow up uh, in one of the uh, videos that uh, is coming out soon on novel and interesting concepts of uh, autism spectrum disorder. The interesting thing about this book is that it is incredibly heavily referenced. I mean, if, if anybody asked, there's just, I just opened this selectively. There's a double page of references. It is heavily referenced with peer-reviewed scientific data. So if someone chooses to refute what you're saying, you've got all the references you can back up with. And if they then choose not to buy into it, it's because they are still clinging on to their own beliefs despite the enormous amount of science. And then we humans do that, okay? We humans do that. We have an opinion that is belief-based and we will support our beliefs despite the science. But there is this growing body of science and I would urge you, urge you to get your copy. You can order on Amazon. You can order it from Elsevier. It is a very, very youth, useful book. And anyone that's a biohacker, this is the way to go. Anyone that's a health practitioner should have a copy of this to be able to practice in the metabolic space. Because by far, the majority of diseases you are going to treat 
irrespective of what kind of healthcare provider you are. From hair to podiatrists, this book has value because it represents a much, much more detailed, science-specific approach to healthcare. And as part of this ketogenic book, um, I want to discuss a transformation that has led in large part to how we have changed our and gone backwards and falsified our understanding of health and science. Folks, I was in the laboratory in uh, the late 90s, oh, in the early 90s, from 90 to 97, I was in the lab doing my PhD while I was doing my general surgery residency. And the universities in North America, I did mine at the University of Toronto in Canada, but subsequently went to the University of Michigan, and the same trend changed. In the 1990s, there was a collective conscious decision by universities to change away from a science foundation based on physiology and anatomy, how the body is structured and how the body functions. And they made a purposeful change away from physiology and anatomy and pathophysiology towards something called epidemiology, outcomes research, where you do a study and you look at the outcomes and then you decide so-called evidence-based medicine. The evidence is based upon outcomes. And while in theory, that is a very laudable way to go because, okay, this is the physiology, let's study the outcomes. But outcomes research should be based on physiologic principles rather than disconnect from them. And what has happened uh, over time is that we have disconnected from physiology as an understanding, as a grounding, and we have become completely epidemiologic, outcomes-based. And if the hypothesis, if what you're testing is not based in physiology, then the outcomes often become ludicrous, distorted, or unreal. And the problem with that is that we're using outcomes so-called evidence-based, it kind of sounds sexy, evidence-based healthcare to determine algorithms for care. And you can point to so many harmful things. The commonest harmful thing is statins. Or even in a video that's coming up, the use of aspirin for cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease being the commonest cause of uh, death in this country. But there are so many, you can look at vaccines. You can look at every aspect of healthcare. Exercise. Should I exercise? Shouldn't I? Diet. What types of diet should I follow? And you can do outcome studies and use statistics from outcome studies to tell you anything you want to hear. Anything you want to hear. And therein lies the problem is that evidence-based medicine is there to support ideology, not science. And then we create this best practices algorithm and every human being has to be plugged like a cardboard cutout into that algorithm and if you as a, as a healthcare provider do not adhere to some outcome statement that changes every few years <laughs> that changes with the next study but if you don't adhere to those outcome epidemiologic studies that are never ever causal their associations at best then you're practicing substandard care i did a ludicrous thing the other day I did a video maybe a year or so ago where I looked at some salt and it was salt that came from a mine <laughs> and it had an expiration date on it. This salt has been lying under the ground for hundreds of thousands of years and now suddenly it has an expiration date on it. Really? Really? It's salt. But thank goodness I was able to use it before the expiration date. That's epidemiology. That's outcome metrics. How the hell does that influence what we do? And more and more, physicians are committing suicide, are burning out, because we're forced to adhere to outcome algorithms that do not benefit our patients. Think of this, okay? Can you imagine treating a heroin addict, addict 
and saying, okay, if this is the dose of heroin that you use, as you stop breathing, this is the dose of Narcan you should use. And yes, go ahead and use your heroin and then use this amount of Narcan so that you don't stop breathing. Okay? Can you imagine that as an algorithm? It's fine to use heroin. In fact, you should be using heroin because it makes you feel good. It makes you feel all fluffy and warm. Use heroin, but then please use this dosage scale of Narcan. And if you then use fentanyl together with that or you use other opioids, xylazine, this is how you manage the dosing. I mean, that, that sounds absolutely ridiculously stupid to do that. It's actually not that stupid. It's exactly what we do currently with diabetes management. Eat this amount of carbohydrate, and then based on the carbohydrates, calculate how much insulin you have to give to yourself before you eat those carbohydrates to get rid of the carbohydrates from your bloodstream that you just ate. Isn't it? Isn't it a little bit better not to use heroin? Isn't it a little bit better not to eat carbohydrates? But that, folks, is epidemiology. Those are epidemiologic studies where the glycemic index and the glycemic load have been studied, and they say, okay, well, this amount happens when this amount, this thing happens, and you use the insulin to... The physiology says, when you eat sugar, this is going to happen. Don't eat sugar. But we've disconnected from that. And as part of that, as part of the, the interesting algorithm, and, and, and this is personal to me, I am the carb addiction doc. I've understood for 23 plus years in myself, in my work, and in my patients that obesity, type 2 diabetes, is not a food problem. It's not a nutrition problem. It's not an eating problem. It's a drug abuse problem. It's a substance abuse problem. And therefore, the way forward is to quit. And folks... <clears throat> That's not new. That's not novel. This is, this is where epidemiology screwed us over. Here's another book. Okay, a patient just gave me this book, and it's, it's a wonderful historical book. It's called The Carbohydrate Addict's Healthy Heart Program. Break Your Carbo-Insulin Connection to Heart Disease. Absolutely spot on. The title says it all. The book is wonderful. We've taken this book and advanced it, and that's why I am the carb addiction doc. I knew this around the same time, 1999, 1998. These guys published this book. It was already predetermined. This book was published in 1999, but clearly it had been a function of their practice for a decade before that, written by Richard Haller, uh, Dr. Rachel F. Haller, and Frederick Vagnini, 1999. This book was based on physiologic principles. Epidemiology became the thing of the day in the mid-90s. This book was the victim of a shift to epidemiology where this book was tossed aside, discarded. If we had listened to this book and followed this as a society, we would have radically reduced the 50 plus percent of people in this country that die of heart attacks every day. I have 50% of all deaths are from cardiovascular disease, directly caused by sugar. We would have radically decreased the number of autism spectrum disorders. I wrote about this in this book. One in 36 kids, eight-year-old kids, is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, a direct consequence of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. Diabetes, PCOS, Alzheimer's. 1989, we had all the data, all the information. We ignored it because of outcome health principles, epidemiology. And now, in 2023, we're struggling to do the same again. That's where healthcare is screwed up. But folks like myself, practicing with This Is Our Textbook, with an organization called SMHP, I believe we are leading the way in defiance of outcome metrics, in defiance of the lipid heart hypothesis supported by, by maybe false epidemiology because we still practice physiology. We still ask why. Why, why, why? Not what happens if. Why? Why does this happen? Let's explain it from a scientific perspective.
This is not fact. This is process. This is understanding the steps toward health, the steps toward illness, how the body functions. That's what we're after, folks. And if you listen to this clip by my mentor, Tim Noakes, you will have some understanding of what we're talking about. So I'm going to end this discussion <coughs> with the editor of this book, The Nutrition Network, headed up by Tim Noakes, and a quote from him in his wisdom about how he and I went through medical school and how he and I came to be who we are. And so many of us in the space. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. If you want to visit with us, if you want an appointment, text us 561-517-0642 anywhere across the world. You can use WhatsApp. There is a waiting list for me, but we will get to you. But retake control of your health physiology, not just some outcome metrics. If you want to leave us a, a, a buck or two, do that on our PayPal account. You'll see it in the show notes. Please leave comments. Please leave questions. The data is there. The science is there. They can choose to not buy into it. They can choose not to believe it. But there is no alternative set of facts. 